In this episode of House of Data, we're looking at how we create, treat, and handle data. As we previously discovered, data could have immense social value. So it seems sensible to keep as much as possible, but what are the realities of storing that data? During filming, we surveyed the UK public sector and found that 47% of organisations plan to keep their data indefinitely. We wanted to know if we should be adjusting our attitude towards data hygiene. I think with data first transformation, the important thing is the life cycle of the data. And I mean, we're talking about data in a very general term here, but actually there are different types of data. Um, and, you know, we've got um, transactional data, which is very dynamic, it's very temporal. Um, it's, it's very much a case of, you know, some information was provided in return for a service received at a particular point in time. When that transaction is completed, there's a question mark over how long do you need to keep that data for before it ceases to have value? Um, because that transaction is now history. So there are regulatory audit legal reasons why you might want to preserve a record of that for a period of time, seven years or whatever the retention period is. But there's no point in keeping that data forever because, again, it's, it's contextual. Um, you need to have all of the, you know, the, the kind of understanding of what was going on at the time. I think I think it's a really challenging question to understand what data you you need to keep uh, for future benefit, um, because one of the great things and one of the great values of data, which we can't put figure on, is the future use cases. So, for example, you know um, I, I mentioned our national underground asset regi register and it's supporting a safe digging uh, example. So to to make sure people don't hit cables when they're digging up the road. But in the future, that same data set, that same system could be used for other examples, uh, some of which we may know now, but some of which we may not know at this moment in time. So I think it, there's no simple answer to the, you know, what data we keep now versus what data, you know, you get rid of now. I think, of course, privacy laws, uh, ethics come in, especially if that's data in relation to people. Um, and then, you know, there's an economic uh, decision needs to be made by organisations because ho holding data, keeping it in the cloud, that comes at a cost. So, you know, you can't do that indefinitely, uh, exponentially forever because that, you know, that has an economic and, and environmental cost of, of data storage. So I think data storage is an interesting one when you start thinking about how things have changed. So there's a couple of angles I think about it. Firstly, is about the sustainability. How much does all this data cost if we're duplicating it and um, not sharing it in ways that are sustainable? Because actually it does have a cost. To keep the servers you know, cool, it needs energy, and we know we're in a global um, climate crisis right now. So is it right that actually we are not deleting things um, or minimising that data? There's another angle from it from thinking about data, um, GDPR and so data protection because that talks about data minimisation. So there is a natural things we should be doing there. And there's some of your retention and deletion schedules that, that should be in place. That means you are deleting data, but are people deleting data? And then the last one I like to think about is actually, it's again about this design, about how do you get all these services to work together? Because actually long gone the day where you can attach you know, a spreadsheet to an email and send it to somebody and then duplicating that data, it's just not cost effective. So how do we make sure that we've got the federated architecture? So you've got um, a decentralized approach to this, but you can bring the data together in services, which means actually you're not persisting the data, you're not adding to the storage problem, but you are able to do your analytics on top of it. And I think that's gonna be the major issue for um, government to really get ahead round because then it's about the design of how you design each of those services then to come together. Having data and hoarding data it's a big problem. And we have to bear in, bear in mind that there are, you know, public sector, there are lots of frameworks, legal frameworks that reside, that are regulated about how long you store data for. And there are very, very valid reasons why that is the case. However, we are storing, we're not, we're not working out what we've got. And the problem we've, that generates 
he's going back and back and retrospectively looking at the data that we have and trying to work out what we should and shouldn't store is becoming problematic. There is this tendency to hoard data and just keep everything, um, partly because we don't know what we don't know, and maybe there'll be some use for something at some future point. Um, but that's got to be realistic. Again, we've got different types of data, structured, unstructured, you know, analytics, insights, and so on. We've got to be really kind of judicious and have policies, governance, regulation around what's appropriate to keep and for, for how long. And I think in the public sector as well, you know, we've got the notion of, you know, what is a record that has to be kept for however long. Um, and, and proper policies around retention periods, which, which it's correct to have. Um, but it might not be appropriate if somebody is no longer using your service or if somebody has passed away um, to retain their data for longer than necessary. So ultimately what it comes down to is you need to know what data you have, you need to know why you're keeping it, and you need to know how long you should be keeping it for. And there comes a point where you need to acknowledge that that data is no longer serving the purpose for which it was first collected and it needs to be removed. We can think about it from today, which is, right, let's classify our data, let's understand what it is, let's label it, and let's store it appropriately. So we can either look at this massive historical problem that we have going back backwards, or what we can do is say, well, let's fix the problem for the future. It became apparent that the data opportunity is vast, but the ethical use of data will be core to the adoption of data modernization strategies and, of course, regulations. But the conundrum, ethics are subjective. There's lots of things you can do with data, but the question is, should you? I know with um, regulation, it's always easier in some ways. Like, you know, when, when GDPR data protection came in, it was easier as, as a practitioner to bring it into an organisation because there was something that, was, that stood there and said, I have to do this, you know, it's there. And that makes it easier to implement. If things are softer, it makes it harder because you need more persuading, more influencing, more answering the why. So there's got to be a balance between the regulation and the code of conduct, which allows the practitioners to be able to have something to stand behind, but allows the speed and movement to allow for the technology changes that means that actually the questions are changing. I mean, there's clearly there's a need for regulation, um, but we've seen things like GDPR, um, you know, which is quite a blunt instrument. It's actually made, in my view, the citizen's life a lot more difficult. It's made the internet a less usable uh, place in the interests of privacy. So again, it's kind of people didn't know what they didn't know about what was going on behind the scenes and websites. It's kind of brought it to face them, but they don't like the inconvenience of having to manage my cookie settings and so on. Actually, it's for your own good and it's to, it's to make sure that your data is not being exploited without your consent. So, you know, it's a tricky path to travel. And then there's also the, um, you know, the the pace of change in technology as well. Um, so again, we've seen with uh, generative AI, um, you know, people are being dazzled by what it purports to do. And then people get really excited about, oh, it can do this and this and this. And then retrospectively, they'll think, oh, but what about privacy? Yeah, I've just, I've just put some personal data in there. Or I've just put some trade secrets in there. Hmm, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Um, so I think, you know, regulation needs to be a framework so that it's flexible to changing circumstances, but it has very clear principles. In Scotland, uh, the government decided about a decade ago to think clearly about, you know, what the use of, uh, you know, personal data that's been given to the government really meant. And uh, the Safe Haven Charter was produced, which explains to the general public very clearly how their data will be used and how it will be kept safe. Uh, it's a really interesting piece of work. And what in Scotland, the way that our data is handled in terms of research is that a researcher goes to a panel, which is called the Public Benefit and Privacy Panel. And that panel offsets the uh, personal rights of privacy 
against the social benefits of using a person's data for research. It, it, individuals are never studied on their own. It's always a big set of data representing a cohort of individuals. And there are very strict rules about uh, the, the, when you do a query, how that, the, the results from that query can be interpreted. There is room for um, regulation, but I think it needs to be really at that, that top level. That means that you can then have your codes of conduct that can move faster underneath. Because I think without those guardrails, then anything is possible. And that doesn't mean that um, you're really thinking about the harms or the benefits of society. So that's really important to start digging into that. The ability to use public data in this way is, is really strong in Wales. Uh, in fact, I'd say uh, the, the, the Welsh are ahead of Scotland, in fact, in many ways. Uh, it's really strong in Scotland. It's been much more difficult in England. And I, I think that's not because there's not a will to do it in England. It's just the population is so large. I think, you know, if you look at the Scottish population, and the Welsh population, which are under 10 million, in both cases, Scotland's about five. That's the sort of number of people that it's much easier to think broadly about having a sensible conversation with a reasonable cross-section of society. I think it is much more difficult in England. I, mean, I hold a view that really we should break England down into regions and have that conversation at a regional level in England. And I think things were, might move forward more, more easily in England if that approach was taken. Data possibilities are seemingly endless. However, the opportunities don't just jump out of the data. We heard that it's about knowing what the problem is you're trying to solve. How data is shared, combined, synthesized and analysed is a complex task. Harmonising data is just the first challenge we must overcome, either by understanding a common taxonomy or setting a new set of principles. We wanted to know if full-scale data interoperability can ever truly be achieved. The sharing of data across public sector organisations can only be a good thing because citizens are demanding more, they expect more from public sector organisations. But of course that comes back to this question of trust, right? Do we trust public sector organisations to do the right thing with our data? We, we talk about government as an entity, we talk about the public sector as an entity. In reality it's, you know, it's hundreds if not thousands of of different organisations of all kinds of different sizes. Um, but what we've got to remember is in the public perception, it's me as a citizen dealing with government. Um, the fact that those departments are different or it's local government versus regional government versus central government, you know, that's irrelevant. I just want to do what I need to do. And um, I think the interesting thing about government is it touches every part of our lives and we will engage with different parts of the public sector throughout our existence, um, throughout all the life events that we have. We just expect that, and I think there's an assumption actually amongst the public, that the government already know everything about them. But yet, it's almost like every department you go to, it's like, well, tell us again. You know, who are you? Where do you live? What's your date of birth? What's your national insurance number? Uh, and you're kind of resetting that process every time. So even though we have multiple government agencies, each one of them is operating within their own privacy constraints and storing their data. You know, data silos, we view them as a bad thing, but actually they exist for very good reasons. So what we need to understand is how we take the right data out of those silos and add them together with other data. So if we think about it from a health perspective, you know, we have guardians and their job is to make sure that my clinical information is used for the right purposes. So as a result, it's locked away in a medical silo. That's fine because it's there for a purpose, it's protected, it's governed, and my privacy is assured. If you then want to share all of that information across lots of other government organisations, that creates a problem. My personal view on interoperability is, is we go back to that challenge perspective. What's the challenge you're trying to solve? Uh, and that's the view by which we should look at interoperability because it's impossible. You can't interoperable all data in the world. Like that's uh, an unachievable ambition and I think it would just cost too much. But what we can do is say these are challenges, these are approaches where we can embed a way of doing things. If you look at other countries, um, so Estonia, one for example, 
They um, they have core registers across each of their government departments, so they don't duplicate data in the same way we probably do it in the UK. And they manage to share it across each of those, so it's a really slick um, citizen service for them. And they were able to, instead of a citizen asking for a service, they were able to predict that the citizen would need that service and able to give them benefits and things they're due. So there's lots of efficiencies when you can join the data up. But again, it's about the transparency, the rights, so people understand what's happening to the data, and they're really clear about it. So Estonia is like only has a population of 1.3 million people. So it so it's quite small, and um, with it starting off as a greenfield site, it does make things easy. In the UK, obviously, we have the challenges of historic art architecture, historic systems, historic ways of doing things. But I think um, to overcome those challenges, it's about really understanding what's the valuable data to um, many people or many organisations and how you join that up together. So I think it's about a number of things have to come together. One of the problems that we encounter with interoperability is you need to get into a very, very detailed, granular understanding of the data so you can turn it into numbers. Let's say, for example, so what we have is in one department they were to call it forename. And in another department, they were to call it given name. So those are two representations stored in two different formats to store my name, Matt. However, you then need to take, so you need to harmonize at that level first so that you have one name associated with that feature. The next thing is, how do you tokenize Matt? Do I tokenize it M-A-T-T? Or do I tokenize it by using some other means? Do I go to a dictionary that says Matt is name 527? And that means that you need to not only understand the names of your features, but you also need to understand how you tokenize them. And this is one of the problems that we face when it comes to, you know, the broad concepts of government is we need a common taxonomy that's going to live across those and get into the next level of detail, which is how we then tokenize each one of the attributes that we have in our feature set. Thus, we have quite a large problem when it comes to large-scale government implementations. There is clearly a challenge in coordinating data projects at scale. The public sector is often unfairly treated as being slower to adopt new technologies than its private sector counterparts. The scale of both the challenges and the opportunities are huge. The amount of data, the number of services to transform is vast. And this is an exciting step forward for many. Next time on House of Data, we look at AI in the public sector, the need for supercomputing, and learn how next generation data first strategies will accelerate progress.